This lecture will unpack the cultural layers throughout history to reveal the urban imprints on Vietnamese cities, particularly Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. We will explore the urban housing and building typologies research and theoretical proposals. The research addressed the current urban and housing issues that occurred during a period of rapid economic and urban development. We will look at a few examples of contemporary architecture that respond to environmental, urban and social economic issues. Vietnamese cities have multi-layered cultural and urban landscapes. Each of these layers resonates with imprint of the historical legacy of the period. The influences throughout histories are Chinese, Chempa, French, Japanese, the USA, and Soviet. Vietnam was Chinese colony for over 1,000 years, from 200 BC to 1009. The country was independently governed for 800 years. During the independent period ruled by the Le Dynasty in the mid 1400s, they conquered Chamba Kingdom, which is now the south of Vietnam. French influence was brought to Vietnam in the mid 17th century. The first French Jesuit missionary arrived in 1627. Vietnam became a French colony from the mid 1800s to 1954. From 1940 to 1945, the Japanese army occupied Vietnam for a short period of time when they were expanding throughout Southeast Asia to seek greater control over China's southern borders. In 1954, the Vietnamese won the French War under Ho Chi Minh's leadership and formed the Democratic Republic of Vietnam with Hanoi as the capital. With the American military support, the Republic of Vietnam was formed in the South in 1954-5. The country was split into North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Due to civil disagreements, the North was led by the Communist Party and the South was led by the anti-communist politicians. When the American troops were withdrawn, the South Vietnamese government lost the war on the 30th of April 1975. The Socialist Republic of Vietnam was formed, led by the Communist Party. In the early years, the country adopted the Soviet bloc political and economic models. From 1986, the country opened up its borders to international trading and economic reform, or also called Doi Mai Change. This facilitated Vietnam's economic growth with increasing foreign investment and rapid urbanization. Vietnam's cultural landscape is layered with several imprints. One of the most significant is Chinese imprint. These can be seen in architecture, urban layout, ancient writing, culture, belief, and religion. Looking at an old map of Hanoi Citadel, we can see the evidence of Chinese urban resemblances, such as the citadel, gated street, and shop house. The canal system was used for water detention and sewage and groups of houses forming small villages. The Indian imprint is mainly visible in central Vietnam, where the Champa Kingdom used to be. The Champa Kingdom used to control the spice trade between China, India, Indonesia, and Persia. This culture was influenced by the Hindu belief. Some temples and ruins still exist to these days. The culture is more evident in music, dance, theater, and textile. After the Jesuit missionary arrived, the Vietnamese writing was changed from Chinese characters to the alphabet. Catholicism was introduced as a new religion. The Western urban planning and infrastructure projects were implemented such as road, pavement, underground drainage, port, and public transport. Colonial architecture and urban layout in Saigon Center are mostly intact. A lot of these landmarks from the French master plan are still here today. The Soviet imprint can be seen in the political system and the early socialist economic model. The need to quickly rebuild the war-torn country and the anti-imperialist anti-feudalism and anti-colonialism sentiment after the war led to prefabricated architecture, the demolition of feudal and colonial buildings, and insensitive developments around historical sites. From 1986, economic reform was introduced to create a socialist-oriented market economy. 
This allows for private ownership of enterprises and the creation of the stock exchange. There was an increase in foreign investments, financial aid, and new developments. Consequently, increased the threat of historical fabric demolition. These maps show the progression of the Hanoi Citadel during three period, feudal, French colonial, and Soviet. The ancient citadel was similar to the Chinese layout with walls, royal palace, and government houses. The French design was a baroque inspired urban layout with diagonal line leading to a visual landmark and garden spaces. The Soviet design featured north-south street axis. Public square adjacent to military headquarters, where the military can quickly take control should there be any public strike or demonstration. With rapid economic development and urbanization, Vietnam has been facing many housing and urban issues. The following research looks at the industrial and development impact of the urban fabric and proposed design case studies to overcome some of the challenges. The mapping and research are a combination of Mapping Ho Chi Minh City Urban Slum by Habitat for Humanity My thesis research on urban slum and resettlements And Making Vietnam, a research collaboration with Gretchen Wilkin and Graham Christ on manufacturing topologies in Ho Chi Minh City Our interests lay in the ambiguous boundary between programs and activities within a neighborhood context the community working and living integrity. Looking at Ho Chi Minh City from the air, the inherent lot size and remnants of the tube house topology is very distinct and obvious, despite the chaotic appearance of the urban fabric. Ho Chi Minh City is Vietnam's second largest metropolitan area after the Greater Hanoi. It covers 2,098.7 hectare and is also one of the region's fastest growing urban centers. Ho Chi Minh City is divided into 19 urban districts and five rural districts. For this study, the urban districts have been divided into urban and semi-urban to more accurately reflect the level of urbanization and development in the city. Mappings were done by spatial analysis, identified by blue dots. Visual analysis and field survey are identified by the red dots. The majority of the slum communities are along Kendoi Canal in District 4, District A along Saigon East West Highway, District 7, the New South Saigon Development, Thu Tim District, the New City Centre Development, and Bintan District. The urban slums locate in prime locations for new infrastructure, commercial, and residential developments. After the slum settlements have been removed to make way for new developments, the communities are moved to resettlement housing complexes within the city or semi-rural areas, usually far away from their original employments and the fine grand street fabric. The informal economic activities and dense urban fabric are interlinked, where street vending and food traffic have a symbiosis relationship. Once the community is displaced from its context, Coupled with unsuitable apartment topology and high market demand for apartments, it is likely to see resettlement apartments are sold off and the community move elsewhere with the possibility of new slum forming. There is a large amount of existing and new industrial parks in Greater Ho Chi Minh City compared to the central and northern Vietnam. The majority of new industrial park clusters have been developed in rural areas, in some cases far away from the established urban areas. For definition, industrial park is an area that produces goods and services to be consumed within the nation. Export zone is an area that produces export goods and services only. There are some key challenges. The establishment of industrial parks accelerate urbanization in rural districts and inflate land prices, which cause the urban poor to move further out. There is an increasing number of people, particularly migrants, are working in and around industrial zones. In 2018, 
34.23% of Ho Chi Minh City GDP came from industry and construction. 20-30% to of Ho Chi Minh City population was migrants. Only about 28% of the workers' housing need is met. There is an identified need for low-cost housing in and around these areas. If that need is not met, new slum settlements could likely occur. The following catalog will look at residential building type and industrial building type to analyze and understand their typology and size and layouts. The typical residential building type is the Vietnamese tube house that has been developed and evolved from the Chinese Asian shop house. We can look at the street house, the villa house, and the rural house and see their relationship in scale and size. And then the apartment buildings and the low cost income apartments, a small row house in the landway, and a slum house. And you can see the drastic difference in sizes between a slum house versus an apartment. And keep in mind that a slum house could accommodate anywhere from four people to ten people. Whether a low income apartment is designed with two bedrooms in mind. The industrial building type is typically a shed. The shed is made out of metal roof, brick walls, sometimes metal walls. It varies in sizes. 20 meters to 50 meters width, 30 meters to 100 meters in length. Sometimes they've got a small front to represent the frontage of the building and creating a smaller illusion than a big building. And the administration area is usually located to the front of the building. The tube house topology can also sometimes be used for manufacturing as well. And in this diagram here, you can see an example of an administration front that looks more like a residential building, but behind it is the shed topology. Then we have the informal type. So this type uses the opportunistic spaces in between buildings, public landways. They would use other infrastructure that, that were created by the other owner. The intersection, the police umbrellas, and offset spaces from the street to create market, even steps in front of another house to create stalls to display the goods. And to understand the anatomy of an urban uh, informal vending system, and understand their frequency and their operation, we we'll look at an example of a laneway in District 4 and pay attention to the pink circle here. This is the mouth of the laneway. That's where the laneway begins and it's got the most foot traffic. So there is a density. This is a node of activities. The most activities that happens at the beginning of the laneway. And these activities filter through as you enter deeper into the laneway. And you can see less static vending activities and more mobile vending activities that penetrate the inner smaller section of the laneways. So we can understand the frequency and the type of street vending that occur within uh, a laneway system. The laneways are used very efficiently. They are usually multitask and multi-purposes. For example, a laneway can be used as a noodle store. Uh, the noodle cart can be on one side with tables and chairs, bike parking along the laneway, and traffic can happen in the middle. At the dead end of a laneway, vertical surfaces of other buildings can be used for clothesline, dish, for planting in the front of the house, which is a public space. It's usually used for dishwashing, storage. 
even the fence can be used for eating as the boundary to park the bike or planting. Front of the house is less of an entrance like the west, but it's more of services because that's where you get water and air and sewage. Wall services become storage space. A veranda is an opportunity for vending to display goods. This image is an example of an opening of a laneway where a static vending took over the laneway and they were selling food. And when there was a push cart going by, everyone pulled their tables and chairs and motorbike onto one side, make space for the push cart. And once that's gone past, then all activities are resumed to normal. And deeper in the laneway, you can see push carts going deeper and providing goods and services to other households. Because the area is so tight here, less static and less foot traffic, so less static vending opportunities are created. We're looking at, again, a very narrow section of a laneway that is used mainly for storage. The laneway is also an opportunity for social and uh, vending opportunities. People make shift with plastic tarp to create sun protection. And because it is a social space and there's food coming in, it's quite lively. And also it's brighter and there's more space than the actual living space inside. And now we are going to look at some proposition models. These proposals will recombine informal and formal urban forms, such as the tube house and the shed. These hybrids will vary in scale. And the purpose of the proposal is to accommodate industrial and domestic function. The question posed is how can we bring the fine grain to the dispersed urban area around the new industrial parks and the larger scale industrial types into the finer grain urban area? The first proposition model is the wall court. It is based on the typical modern tube house. Instead of having the houses being side by side, this typology rotate and stack the house at each end. It will allow for the longer size to be exposed to air and ventilation. And also it will form a very thick wall that separate two functions in the urban context that are more likely not to be next to each other. For example, an open space like a park and an industry area. This is an example of what it could look like. It creates a sense of perforation between the two very different spaces. Open space or rural space on the other side would be factory. The next proposition model is called big roof. This tactic combines the large shed roof with the market store part to form flexible infrastructure for manufacturing an industrial market. The large footprint of the shed is typically a, ma a major fat manufacturing plan. It's open at the side and populated with small pots of space interspersed with covered open space. It satisfies the need for substantial infrastructure, such as protected storage, transport, and it is accessible by small manufacturers like a market which allows micro operators to benefit from the combined resources and services. It might contain incubated startups and small scale enterprises. Inserted into the urban fabric, it combines big scale factory and dense varied fine grain at street level. So an example of the big shed that houses very smaller manufacturers and an example of the big shed model integrated into a fine grain urban fabric where the manufacturing is elevated on the top creating an undercrop space that facilitate for other industrial activities and manufacturing or retail activities below the third topology is called the street teeth 
This typology is based on the typical modern tube house and its goal is to activate the street and counteract the really large empty street that we see in industrial parks areas. By having smaller scale frontage to the industrial areas and splitting, separating these houses to create these opportunistic gaps. And also they create the urban access to the industrial area at the back. A secondary laneway can be located behind these house, the buildings, the chip house buildings, and these can be the service access for the industrial areas. And this is an illustration of what that could look like. The teeth with spaces in between and it can even be uh, occupied underneath as well. And how this can be integrated into uh, a dense urban area. And now let's look at the historical origin of the tube house. The long skinny tube house type was originated from the Chinese shop house and also the tax law during the French colony period. The amount of tax paid was measured by the front window area. The tube house type was narrow and long with a mass void sequence to let air and light in each section of the house. Culturally, multiple Vietnamese generations would live together in one household. The tube houses nowadays get taller to accommodate the increasing family sizes and also increase density. The traditional tube house topology was the basis for my thesis where it looked at ways to incorporate the informal living and working lifestyle while it addresses the expansion of family sizes and cost factors for resettlement housing in District 4 in Ho Chi Minh City. It also looked at a solution to the modern tube house where cross ventilation and light access have been an ongoing problem. The house type looked at modifying the traditional tube house topology to allow space for expansion and informal activities to take place. They have double frontage and user control shading devices. As you can see from the diagrams below here, the traditional tube house is rotated 90 degree and increased in height and expanded in length, where it created the gaps between the buildings and those become the opportunities for future expansion and in the meantime it is open spaces for other informal activities to occur. The urban void created between the houses will eventually be filled up and occupied by the inhabitants when their economic situation change. This would help keep the initial buying costs low and making it more equitable for the urban slums residents. From a master planning perspective, the, princi the principle learned from mapping the laneway is used to generate a larger area at the beginning of the laneway or we call it the mouth of the laneway where there is more foot traffic so urban spaces is created to support acti activities like market static vending generate and, and promote more informal activities and when the houses are shifted and create the opportunistic spaces in between that would also help support for more informal activities to happen. The void in between these houses are acting as the exaggerated veranda space before they get filled up. The following diagrams will show the translation of the urban mapping into the scheme and in this particular diagram you can see the opportunistic offset spaces is actually facilitated and turned into a market space at the beginning of a laneway with the illustration of how that could look like 
and these opportunistic spaces due to incremental build up in Saigon urban area is learned and facilitated and embraced in the scheme as well with shelter is provided and the offset spaces between the buildings uh, take into account those activities the steps and the veranda a translation of the social space and the mobile vending space with the makeshift plastic top in this scheme it is facilitated and taken into account to promote for these activities. The space at the front of the landway that was used for domestic services is embraced with the void. So this void is an, opportunist, uh, is an opportunity for informal vending or for domestic services and eventually it will be filled out as the residents progresses or improves their economic situation. The terrace spaces is uh, acting in the same manner as the veranda space on the ground, but with an increase in privacy. The anatomy of a unit consists of a service core this is used for circulation and wet surfaces. And each level is an apartment in itself that is flexible. There is no room specified. We only provide for wet services, bathroom and kitchen. And the rest of the floor plan is open and will be adapted to the resident's needs. The space in between that is for future expansion and the facade are fully operated by the inhabitants to control ventilation and lights. And each unit have two frontages that will facilitate for cross ventilation. The waterfront area is privatised instead of being for public. There is still quite a lot of boat trading happening in Ho Chi Minh City particularly the, in the informal economic context. A lot of goods are still being transported to the city from Megong Delta by this medium. The public waterfront is introduced further in the laneway in the master plan. So we created these canal channel, the private, the more public canal channel that penetrate deep into the master plan. And they also interlink with the landway network. So this way, it generate a walkability for the residents from the landway to the waterfront and to the next section of the master plan. As this demonstration you can see here, activities, uh, the public activities at the waterfront, it's more close, it's closer to the landway network. And now we will look at a series of projects. They all respond to very similar set of issues due to rapid urbanization and the fast growing economic force, as well as the huge influx of population. So the first project we look at here is a very small project. It's a pavilion of origins by Hong Wing Architects in Hanoi. This project is a conversion of a rooftop into a private open space that is layered with uh, a steel grid. The layers are landscaped and also functional spaces. This project is a direct response to the lack of greenery, public open spaces and private open spaces in Hanoi as a very fast growing city in the last 30 years. Hanoi fast becoming a huge metropolitan area in uh, and as well as the capital city of Vietnam. The, the, the roof terrace is a collection, it has a collection of air purifying plants and acting as an oasis for the inhabitants. 
The next project is the Saigon House by A21 Studio. This house locates in Ho Chi Minh City. From the outside, looking at the front facade, it is quite unassuming, even though it blends in quite well with the surrounding context. And it has very familiar elements, such as the screen, the door and the window panels, the colors, they're all brought back from a period in the past and incorporated for, so that the house would blend in with the other cheap houses on the street. However, it addresses a very particular set of problems that the modern cheap house inherit. Modern cheap houses are ge genetically having two partition walls and quite long. They, they have an issue with light and ventilation because of the length of the block and they usually have two or more stories so making ventilation and sunlight is a huge challenge as well as the visual and, con and social interaction between the different spaces within the house. So this house is not only an example of nostalgic elements of the past but it also directly tackle the social issues and the light and ventilation issues that encountered in the, the modern tube house. As you can see here, the volume of the house is dissected and modulized into pots that are stacked vertically within this very long and narrow volume. And because the way that they are stack quite concentrically. If you look at the void rather than the actual volume of the pots, you can see that there is a large chunk of the void in the middle, which is the living room and the kitchen. And the void opens up, but then directly expand into each of the pots that are the bedrooms. So the visual connection and the spaces are arranged in a concentric manner here where every single space of the bedrooms have a direct visual link to the other bedrooms as well as mainly to the main living room in the middle and because the weight of these houses that the pots are stacked it enables for light and ventilation to get through uh, and also it creates a sense of being semi-outdoor when you are actually in the living room and have a sense of a vertical village. So in a way, the, even though the floor area, the growth floor area is reduced, but what it provides to the inhabitants is a sense of space, light, ventilation and a sense of a village with the notion that a family is also like a village. A multi-generational family is a common thing in Vietnam. So uh, having that connection, that social connection is quite important rather than being segregated into the cake layers. After India's partition, waves of refugees came to the cities and new state capitals were created. Various population groups were relocated to work on development projects such as plantations, coal mining and building factories. In these post-independence years, housing became an important part of nation building and various institutions were given the task of delivering housing. In 1957, Balkrishna Doshi was successful at realising the low-cost staff housing and guest house for the Ahmedabad Textile Industries Research Association. The project was characterised by a series of brick vaults and private courtyards. Doshi subsequently won more commissions for subsidised housing. In 1970, the government was increasingly aware of the built environment and tackling the slum proliferation. Doshi had been doing research and developed new approaches to social housing by engaging the users' participation. This created the possibility for urban planning and architectural topology to adapt to the user's changing needs and requirements. 
In 1983, the Indoor Development Authority commissioned Doshi to solve the serious problem of housing shortage. This project was co-funded by World Bank and India's Housing and Urban Development Corporation. Doshi said that, even if it is made of bricks, housing cannot be thought of as permanent. And the most important thing is to think about the project over time. Housing is not inert, it is a living entity. His low-rise, high-density built forms is a contrast to Le Corbusier plan for Zin high-rise towers in Paris. Aranya houses connect with the ground and constantly evolve, where the plan for Zin towers are static and repetitive. The low-cost housing project was designed for the city's economically weaker sections, as well as the slum and the street dwellers. It aims to provide a framework and access to land with services such as sewage, storm drainage, water and power, rather than delivering completed houses. Over time, as the residents' resources, needs and desire for more space increase, homes begin to grow, forming an urban fabric that is interwoven by private rooms, outdoor staircases, shared courtyards, streets, open spaces and roads. Doshi combined the understanding of efficient and durable infrastructural system with the growth pattern of informal housing to create a set of parameters for the Aranya development. This knowledge came from his previous commissions and the research of human settlements in India while working at the Vastu Shilpa Foundation. Bernard Rudovsky said that there is much to learn from architecture before it became an expert art. Instead of focusing on the materials and techniques, Doshi observed and analyzed the existing social structures, the traditional ways of living, the vernacular traditions, and the residential structures. This helped him understand how everyday habits translated into spaces. From the study of the existing slums, the semi-private public space in front of the houses have the private characters. This is the space where domestic activities spill over. It integrates the houses with the streets and is very culturally important in the daily routines. The slums are not only for living, but also for working. Existing slums of indoor reveals that arranged production of goods and services are undertaken at home. They can range from food production, incense sticks, refurbishment of wood crates and baskets. Therefore, these activities need to be accommodated in planning the new developments. The street in the informal settlements indicate hierarchy of activities based on their widths and physical characters. They are used as public open space as well as circulation. The smallest plots of Arania are just 35 square meters. It has a concrete plinth, a service core with water supply and the option of a kitchen. The 85 hectares provide 6,500 plots, which all connected to sewage, water and electricity. The services need to work with the slope of the land to use gravity rather than mechanical pumps. The open spaces change in scale from dwellings to clusters and neighbourhood. They link the most intimate parts of the development to the commercial and public amenity in the middle. In 1989, only 80 model houses were built. They had low bearing brick walls and concrete slabs. The walls were plastered and painted. A set of architectural elements such as rails, parapet, cornices, stairs, doors and windows were provided and they could be appropriated by the residents. The informal growth is planned for and confined by the master plan's hierarchy of built form and open spaces. Doshi said that while the purchase of a house does not automatically make it yours, the moment you give them ownership, you give them the foundations of their home. The ownership and the sense of identity were created once the residents started completing and extending their homes. The plots were initially purchased on a first-come, first-served basis, but as the popularity of the project increased, buyers had to enter a lottery system. Aranya master plan evolved through numerous variations. The initial plan prepared by Indoor Development Authority shows a set of repetitive clusters set out in a rigid grid. This evolved into a proposed plan with distributed open spaces and street hierarchies. The later stage master plan took into consideration the block orientation to be north-south to minimize heat gain, increase shading, build form variations, 
interlinked open spaces and road networks. The town centre is located centrally. This is connected to the neighbourhood via linear public open space corridors, where lower level communities facilities were distributed to service each neighbourhood. The road network had a clear hierarchy of a central north-south spring road. This is staggered to discourage through traffic. Sector level roads are orientated east-west to service each neighbourhood and the streets branch from the sector level roads into the housing clusters. The roads drive traffic out into the highway and main roads. The higher income housing group locate along the highway and the southeast corner. The middle income housing group locate on the peripheries and the lower income housing group are in the clusters in the middle. This creates an eggshell type of framework where the more rigid and established houses are on the periphery to present the development. The continuously changing topology is in the middle, or have an equitable access to the town centre. The pedestrian access link the neighbourhood with the town centre. They draw people inwardly while the roads draw traffic outwardly. This achieves a clear and safe segregation of vehicles and pedestrian movements. The conventional method of placing toilets in front goes against the culture, and this method connects eight toilets to one manhole. The proposed arrangement of services slots allows toilets at the back of the houses, while connects 18 toilets to one manhole and a sewage line. This achieved 50% saving on infrastructural cost. At the same time, the service slots became a local play areas for children. Learning from the slums, Doshi said, what you need to find is to create, not separation, but buffer zones, places where there is room for variations. He sees communities and the physical spaces they live in as organic and messy. They constantly adapt to the built environment. Nowadays, it is difficult to identify where Aranya is. Almost all of the original 80 model houses have been demolished. Only a small number of these still exist and they are absorbed by the sprawling urban growth of indoor. The next project that we will look at is the Red Roof House by TAA Design in Vietnam. This project is the response to rapid urbanization in rural area. It is an evolution of the tube house topology where density and rural living lifestyle are combined together. Land in rural areas have been significantly increasing in value. This triggered private subdivision. The rural town area became denser while they are still adjacent to agricultural fields. The site area is 80 square metre, a relatively small block of land in the rural context. It is adjacent to the main road going through the village. Urbanisation has drastically changed the urban fabric of the rural township. It can be seen with long and narrow residential subdivisions. As the consequence, the long brick tube house with steel roof became the default topology. This results in a conflict with the rural lifestyle and the city tube house topology. The client is an elderly couple who has been living in this rural area since they were born. The architect is tasked with creating housing topology that accommodates the rural way of life within a smaller and denser urban context. The key daily functions in a rural residential topology are paddy drying, vegetable gardens, chicken pens, multi-purpose playgrounds. All of these require outdoor area that is integrated with the internal space of the house. In a small site like this, the ground floor is now required to house a variety of complex functions, such as bicycle repair space, living room, kitchen, traditional outdoor wood stove, bedrooms, toilets, paddy drying yards, rice storage and chicken yard. The architect proposed to weave the outdoor programs with the indoor program by adapting the traditional tube house topology. Small courtyards are inserted into the building mass horizontally and vertically. Each of the outdoor space plays an important role in the daily activities. The front yard is a space for bicycle repair, parking, an open space to interact with the neighbours, the middle courtyard is a wet service yard for domestic animal and cooking. The mezzanine courtyard is for paddy drying, wood storage and provides natural light and ventilation to the indoor space. The rear courtyard is for clothes drying. 
The rooftop garden is adjacent to the courtyard of the mezzanine floor. It creates a playground and a vegetable garden. The fresh produce from the garden would go directly into their everyday meal and the couple have been very happy sharing their produce with the neighbours and the family and created a sense of community. The rooftop garden also acts as a very efficient thermal insulation layer compared to steel roof. It keeps the temperature inside the house cool and temperate all year round. The slope of the roof towards the front of the house would not only facilitate the garden terrace, but it reduces the building bulk, inserts glimpses of greenery and creates a direct communication between the rooftop and the street. This is a gesture that attempts to preserve the low density streetscape of the rural village. In the architect's word, the red roof has the intent to keep, store and remind the familiar rural lifestyles. The next project is Chodok House, designed by Nishizawa Architects. The project locates in Chodok Town in southern Vietnam. It accommodates a multi-generational family, which contains three nuclear families. Due to the tight construction budget and limited local materials and transportation, the house could be built out of thin metal sheets and timber frames. It embraces light, ventilation, and the external environment. It is as if the inhabitants live in a half outdoor garden. By surveying the local context, the architect observed four key layers shown on the drawing left to right. The first layer is the floating houses on the river. The second layer is the elevated roads on both sides of the river embankments. These roads act as the main vehicle access and thoroughfare through the town. The third layer is the pilotis houses that are connected to the roads by small private bridges. The fourth layer is the open rice field. The pilotis houses are commonly supported by stone or concrete columns on the ground. The houses are framed by timber and cladding is corrugated metal. The houses are elevated off the ground to allow for flood water to flow through in monsoon season. The column sizes are limited by the boat capacity which gives the impression of low-laying houses. Before the embankments were built along both sides of the river, the ground was covered in river water for four to five months a year. Living with boats and water is an integral part of the daily life. The ground level was used to house domestic animals and storage, and the habitable spaces were elevated. The yearly flood would clean out the ground floor and the water helps lower the internal temperature. Based on the understanding of the local housing typology, climate and custom, the architect aimed to use local materials and construction techniques. They employed three key design strategies. The first strategy is to open the interior space to the surrounding environment by inverting the pitch roof to three butterfly roofs at different heights. The second strategy is enabling natural sunlight and ventilation by creating large openings between the roofs and at both ends of the house. The third strategy is to create a fluid, flexible and continuous space by replacing internal solid walls with movable partitions. The project aims to create semi-outdoor and contemporary spaces that is full of natural elements such as sunlight, wind, water, soil and plants. At the same time, it preserves the vernacular characteristic and regional lifestyle. The exterior is also consistent and sympathetic with its context. It blends in with the surrounding environment, but still holds a distinct architectural expression. Modernity has introduced a default long, narrow, multi-storey tube house typology. This has been applied across the urban and rural areas. It changed the unique cultures, landscape and lifestyles of these regions. The architect's mission here is to reinvent the vernacular typology 
to adapt the emerging needs without erasing heritage and history. It can be said that Chodok House is the resistance to the modern tube house topology. House of Trees by Bajomier is a response to the environmental and detached human relationship in the modern tube house topology. The modern tube house adopted Le Corbusier domino principle with only one frontage. It encounters natural light and ventilation issues. It also separates the domestic programs into layers. Located within a block with no frontage, the inhabitants would have to enter the block via laneway, that's number one on the left hand side. The house is separated into detached volumes. The inhabitants would have to walk outside to go to different sections of the house, but also these volumes, they face a central courtyard, that's number four. This celebrated cross communication and visual link between different rooms and programs of the house and it also tied people back to the natural environment outside and celebrate the greenery that it is providing as a direct response to the lack of park space and open space in Ho Chi Minh City. In conclusion, there are some key trends in contemporary Vietnamese architecture which attempt to resolve the urban challenges caused by the increase in density of the built fabric and urban demands. These range from the lack of private and public open space and vegetation, noise and air pollution, the inherent ESD problems of the modern tube house, and the social economic inequality. Thank you.